Hi, I'm Martina Garcia, the director of the CSFI. And uh, today we are having uh, our new our May session on uh, London Calling, where we discuss financial services issue of particularly relevance to, to the UK, to the city, even if some of them are not uh, decided in the UK. And uh, we have, uh, uh, we are still incredibly grateful for Barnett for uh, anchoring uh, this series. And um, and today we have uh, another guest, Tamara. Uh, and uh, I'm going to leave things in the hands of Barney. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. Well, today it's a huge pleasure to be joined by Tamara Box, um, a very distinguished uh, lawyer in the city, but I'll uh, hand over to her to introduce herself to you all. Thanks, Barney, and thanks, Martina. Delighted to be with you both. Um, so I am the managing partner for Europe and Middle East uh, at Reed Smith, and I, I sit on our senior uh, exec here. Um, but much more uh, importantly to me, and probably to you, I'm a finance yes, lawyer uh, by day, as it were, uh, and cover a wide range of, uh, of financial um, transactions of various types, particularly on the more complex end of things. Um, and certainly very interested in everything I know we're going to cover today. So thank you for asking me to join. Great. Great. No, it's a pleasure. Um, so just uh, thought we'd start with um, the ECB's um, desk mapping exercise where we can talk about um, the implications of that for the city. Uh, for those who hadn't um, read about this or heard about it, the ECB has reviewed the booking and risk management practices of, of the trading desks of the largest banks globally, um, aiming uh, to ensure that EU subsidiaries of non-European firms have adequate governance and risk management capabilities and do not operate empty shells. And they're saying, um, Andrea, Andrea, um, has um, sort of summarized the outcomes of this and has, say, uh, has said, the ECB is saying, uh, that they're concerned about empty shells located in the Euro area that book exposures remotely with their parent company or book them locally, but relying on um, relying fully on risk management hubs and financial infrastructure located as, as in third countries, i.e. in this case, the UK. 56 trading desks were identified as needing uh, remedial action. And so they want sort of heads of desk within the Euro entity, uh, Euro area entity. They want the um, desk to have adequate infrastructure and senior traders, uh, governance and internal control framework for remote booking and limited reliance in, in, on intra-group hedging. What do you make of that, Tamara? <laughs> well, it's certainly an area that's occupying a number of our team. Um, I think it is fair to say that you know, many of our clients uh, will have moved people uh, into Europe um, post-Brexit in order to ensure that they had uh, a presence and also you know, access um, once passporting fell away. Um, there's you know, also no question that some of the things that are described in that blog um, you know, are what our clients have been doing and indeed what financial services um, have been doing. Uh, I think, you know, the, the suggestion that some 70% of those desks still uh, implement sort of back-to-back -back booking models um, is no doubt right. And I think that was, that was really the kind of original approach. I suppose the question becomes, you know, wh what does that mean going forward? Um, you know, we are seeing certainly expectations by uh, financial services institutions that they will need to move more senior people. They will need to put in place greater governance um, in the jurisdictions in Europe where they've chosen to, to move um, their operations. Um, so I think there is you know, a degree of, of sort of seriousness uh, with which this you know, has been taken. Um, there's obviously also lots of questions that remain around sort of how far and, you know, what are the implications for, um, you know, for financial services operations here in the city. Um, you know, again, you can pick different institutions. We've seen, you know, greater or lesser degree of movement um, already. Uh, but I think it is, you know, it is something that's not going away. Um, and again, I think this, you know, this recent published um, statistics suggests um, that the ECB is taking it very seriously, and, and I, I don't know that there's a lot of room to um, to ignore it. But I'm interested in your views, Barney, because I think you know there are still some 
um, other options that I know um, I know you have considered. Yeah, I mean, so this reverse solicitation, isn't it? So um, EU law, like many other laws around the world, allows um, businesses and consumers in the EU to seek to opt out of EU law and to uh, be protected by the laws and regulations of the seller and seek out services from outside the EU under under local laws at their own option. And I think, you know, particularly in the wholesale markets, uh, that's uh, currently underused. I think um, there was a warding off program of, of uh, sort of statements and so on from EU bodies trying to stop that happen. Uh, but actually, it's in the law, and and I think it can and should be used more. And I suppose my other thought on this is what Andrea and Ria and ECB are saying is is that. In the name of risk management, more needs to be within the Euro in in the EU. In the case of the ECB eurozone, um, I mean, but back to back booking and so on, which is one of the targets for this, is a well known practice. It's in use all over the world, has been for decades, um, and is in use in the UK um, for so for some UK businesses. So um, the 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 sort of reason so. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the regulatory architecture and the structures being used, but in the name of risk management, they're wanting more moved there. And I suppose the point I'd add to this is the irony of the matter is that the Eurozone is itself the creation, the creator, in my view, of the probably the largest sort form of first world systemic risk, financial risk, because its legal architecture involves running a scheme without, legally speaking, and um, without having a sovereign debt instrument underpinning it, there's some sort of rounding error amount for COVID, but uh, essentially member bonds are not sovereign in the true sense because they can't tell the ECB to print more, more money to repay their debts. And um, there's no guarantee the ECB would agree to do that. And in fact, indications politically are, are that they wouldn't. Um, there are limits to that because of the redistribution of wealth that occurs as a result of that sort of step. So um, we're in a situation where legally, that there's a sort of difference between legal and what the markets assume. Legally, the liabilities through the Eurozone system are not properly backstopped. Um, and the market is assuming a, a, level, a level of mutualization of debt, which is just not there in law and it's not there in the accounting treatments or on balance sheets either. And I think that is a massive source of systemic risk. So I just observe it's an irony that the ECB are trying to lure in business using risk management grounds when they're actually creating that risk and their system of laws and regulations ignore the elephant in the room. Uh, you know, which is the key driver of any management, which was the cause of the financial crisis and, you know, the thing everyone really, all the regulators should really be focused on uh, because it's their main job. How do you see the the resolution plans uh, effect? Because this uh, policy of, uh, you know, trying to make sure that the, the booking is done in the in the jurisdiction where the activity is taking place is, is very much inspired by the by the Banking Resolution Directive. The Americans do exactly the same thing with their resolution plans. Hmm? The, uh, do you see a link there or do you think, uh, because I mean, any, any, and then Ria speaks about it too. What happens when uh, banks fail hmm, is then uh, um, uh, they become national as Mervyn King used to say. Hmm? So well, how do you think the ECB should deal with that one? Well, I think this Eurozone structure is at the heart of it, which is that the conversation is proceeding on the basis that the Euro liabilities in law are exactly the same, it's the, the same as the dollar zone. And so the, 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 the assumption behind this entire analysis is, oh, well, the US are doing the same, UK, in fact, is doing the same, so we should do the same. But it's not, it's not, you're not looking at apples and apples, you're looking at something completely different and then trying to apply this logic, which actually then makes it more dangerous. I mean, of course, and, and that happened uh, in in the, in the crisis. But um, uh, normally, one of the lessons of the crisis was then uh, we uh, banks should be uh, resolvable without uh, uh, state money. Huh? So, uh, and uh, and that's one of the key principles in the banking union. Hmm? There is a resolution fund already in place 
for deposits. Hmm? So what else do you think? Why is that still so important? Why is that as important as it was in 2010? Because in a way it's like if resolution had the, you're admitting and the, the whole policy towards making banks resolvable uh, is not going to work. Is, is that uh, your perspective? Um, we've got a um, pan-EU resolution framework, same as in the UK, in fact, mm -hmm. and, and, and that is not totally different from what is in place in the States. Look, I think those, those work. I think those are very sensible um, things that came from people like Paul Tucker at the Bank of England, you know, the idea of bail and so on. All of that's very sensible. But then you've got national insolvency laws. So Eurozone Bank actually is not under Eurozone control. It's going to be resolved under a national insolvency law with when if, if there were to be a liquidity requirement or, a, a, for, or even more from a central bank, then the state in questions hasn't got a central bank. It's the ECB that you look to for the money. That's the key point. That's the key legal leap that's being overlooked yeah. in all of this analysis. And that's unique to the Eurozone. And then you've got, um, you haven't got a pan-EU deposit guarantee. Uh, you deposit do deposit. now, more or less. Well, there, were, there was agreement on that not that long ago. And you do have a pan-European, well, a pan-European, not a Eurozone resolution fund. But you haven't got a deposit guarantee scheme, for instance, that's... Yes, um, yeah. They uh, had, uh, the, I, I think uh, you will find it took, it took them forever and ever and ever. But I think there was, uh, last year, you know, there was an agreement, the Germans at the end did agree to have at least one layer of uh, common deposit guarantee. Tamara, do you know? Do you have specificities? I can't remember. I think we need to take it. Mm -hmm. There but, was progress on that file for the first time in 10 years. I don't think, because it was, it was objected to, I remember when Schultz was involved um, uh, only a couple of years or three years ago. I, th I think, I'm not sure it's a fully mutualised deposit guarantee scheme across the EU, because the issue politically within the EU is if you have an industry funded deposit guarantee scheme for the, a northern Eurozone state and it's pan EU, you know, then uh, and there's a calamity in the southern state, then the fund could be yeah. used. Yeah, 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 to, yeah. And so everyone is being, you're, you're effectively transferring risk from the south to the north, potentially, through that process. And that was the controversy. And I don't think it's been fully, anyway, this is a quite a factual question we should check. <laughs> and, and I mean, ultimately, Barney, I guess the question becomes, you know, so it, it, you know your, your point, um, assume that is entirely valid, but it doesn't it, you know, really not change how the ECB is nonetheless approaching this. And so for financial institutions who don't feel capable of using solely reverse uh, solicitation, and you know we, we could discuss that, but realistically, many have already made a move beyond um, you know, ex expecting to use reverse solicitation, either because they're looking at more consumer product um, or, or because they feel they, you know, they expect to be um, more active, they're, they're still sort of stuck, right? I mean, at the end of the day, we aren't really expecting those institutions to argue with the ECB on the basis you've outlined. Well, there'll, there'll be some people that just do do full reverse solicitation, but I agree, very large, significant organizations doing multiple business lines and so on, involving on the ground marketing and so on. That's no. not, it's not a panacea. But I think there'll be a reweighting or rebalancing. So I think um, there'll be greater use of reverse solicitation at the same time as a much more focused work, um, working out of what you do need on the ground, which yeah. is being forced by this ECB in the first place. There'll be a, a Twin Peaks approach. Yeah. I mean, it's, like, it's not that you won't have things on the ground. You will for a full service organization wanting to do all sorts of things that do exactly. with any analysis and things on the ground. But I, I think you're not going to be... I think the intention behind some of this, dare I say it, is to pull you know, a whole massive wadge over. I think it's going to have the opposite effect because I think it'll lead to people looking much more carefully at, at how they're doing things and whether things need to be done in a particular way. And so it'll be isolating the true on the ground elements, which I'm not sure is the result they're wanting. But anyway, I think that's my prediction. Interesting. Okay. I think I would go the other direction, um, which is to say, and maybe it's just the the, the mood music at the moment, which is it feels as if that pull um, and, you know, 
as I say, I don't think anyone is is you know expecting to make the argument to the ECB when they're looking at their sort of targeted supervisory action um, that you've made. I think they're looking at it saying, okay, you know, we've made this choice to be there, as you say, be um, on the ground and indeed provide a variety of services. So now we are going to have to comply with what the ECB asks, which includes greater, you know, seniority of personnel, governance structures, et cetera. And I think. I, I think it is happening, um, but I also think that the ECB are probably not going to let up. And so I, I totally, you know, accept the the Twin Peaks analysis in terms of reverse solicitation for those who have not made that choice or feel they can. But you know, we're talking certainly the larger institutions have already made a decision. They're there now. The question is, how much more there do they have to be? And I think the you know this feels like a pretty straightforward suggestion that they have to be more there there um and that that's what you know that's what i i think we're hearing our clients feel they're going to have to to respond to and i think this ties in with a topic we're going to come back to uh, or come to later which is removal of red tape within the uk eu inheritance Absolutely. because <laughs> you know right now a lot of the rules are quite similar i think um as you roll things forwards you know where the profit is being made, you know, what the customers are being sure. asked to pay for financial services, it's going to drive a lot of these decisions. So all things being equal, you know, if, if exactly the same laws, fine, you end up with this sort of tussle and one can debate exactly what's going to happen. I think that dynamic changes as it becomes more obvious there are more profitable ways to do financial business while still doing it safely under a legal regime that's perhaps more focused. That's fair. I find it incredibly ironic that we have this discussion about where people are in a, in a post-COVID <laughs> age in which we are all doing this from our homes or offices in separate locations. But uh, agreed, <laughs> and that, that may cause us a, a, a little bit more problem rather than less, Barney, even in your analysis, because people may want to be in some of these other places that happen to be in Europe. So. <laughs> Well, a lot of it's about tax, isn't it, as well? I mean, under the surface, no, you, um, you know, there's going to have to be a way of assessing how to tax organisations where people are working remotely, but it's just one or two people doing a tiny yeah. function that's not a business in its own right. Yeah. Uh, entirely agreed. And that, that I think, vexes yeah. all of us still. So, <laughs> Barney, should we move to the next topic? Yes, so the next one is, um, I, I think we would be remiss if we didn't touch on the, the sort of dramatic events in the crypto digital asset world um, of the last days. Um, so, you know, Bitcoin on the 10th of May was reported to fall and fall below $30,000 for the first time since July 2021. Um, we had the dramatic effect, um, the collapse of the cryptocurrency Luna, um, um, Terra, and, and then we had um, Tether, which is a currency notionally pegged to the US dollar at one dollar, actually fell below uh, the dollar um, temporarily. Now, Terra, uh, Tether is still being used. And the crypto world carries on. Some of things, some of the market, you know, the valuations have, have come back. But it, there is a sort of, um, I mean, the point for discussion now really is what this teaches us for regulatory purposes. I suppose the other fact is the Bank of England's FPC discussed in March uh, how the failure of any systemic stablecoin, quite presciently, uh, would impact public confidence in payments and possibly even the financial system. So. This is a massive topic of the moment. The question is, you know, we talked pro previous in previous sessions at a ten thousand foot level about how, how might one regulate it, but you know, the question is, how does the how do these events change our thinking? Oh. Well, I, I mean, I think that there's a couple things that probably come out of it. One is thinking about, you know, how does anything that has, a, you know, a significant um, economy wide uh, financial impact play out? Well, you know, the short answer is typically because regulators are retrospective with how they look, it leads to increased regulation. Um, and you regulate, you know, you regulate on the basis of the horse having bolted, but you're still going to try to close the barn door. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's likely where we are headed. And I think that's what's been signaled um, already uh, by the FCA. 
the question is going to become, you know, where do we go with that and, and what is the impact? Um, I think it, it's clear that where we started with just really focusing on the regulation from a, you know, an anti-money laundering perspective um, hasn't necessarily been altogether helpful. Um, and certainly now thinking about where crypto falls in the current and existing regulation, we can see that there's a great deal of uncertainty, which is probably not helpful for the UK. It's certainly not helpful for, um, you know, trading of, of any of those, uh, you know, the crypto um, in this market. So now it's going to become what, what comes next and how much do we, you know, do we diverge? Probably learning from, um, I think in particular Europe on that and what they might have gotten wrong. Um, but, you know, the FCA has gone out with their, um, I guess in March, as you say, had this uh, sprint, crypto sprint uh, meeting. And I think we're expecting over the summer to see some outcome from that. But it's been clear that there is a perception, and, and I think, you know, pr prescient, but now probably proven that, you know, there is um, a speculative nature to these assets. So regulation is inevitable. Um, again, there's some distinctions. What can you, you know, what you regulate um, as a financial product and what might not be. And I think, you know, we could talk about that, but it is clear that we are going to see regulation. Um, I think it's going to be good though. The reality is right now without regulation, because much of what we have would potentially capture these actions and activities, um, but capture it in a way that is entirely inappropriate for a cryptocurrency, that's unhelpful. Um, so trying to get to something that is specific, um, maybe goes goes beyond um, particularly where we've gotten to around, you know, really just looking at the, the sort of dangerous nature and actually starts to regulate the impact on the payments um, system would make more sense. I think the biggest issue that that, you know, we foresee is resources within the FCA. Um, right now, we know they're not coping with registrations for the system we have, and it's very, you know, simple and straightforward. Relatively, um, they're really not coping, you know, with getting those um, over the line. So, how does the FCA propose to cope with a greater regulation, um, you know, uh, of these assets? Uh, in effect, and, and how do they, you know, propose to do that? while also doing, and, you know, if we think about the Queen's speech, um, certainly huge, you know, huge sways of that uh, relate to financial services and new legislation and new bills, and certainly with respect to the regulator, new powers. So I think that's, that's probably the biggest risk is that not that we don't, you know, sort of get regulation right, because I think the FCA has, you know, indicated they've got some, uh, you know, some of the strongest minds involved and lots of people, you know, focus on how to do that in a way that it is attractive um, but taking into account this concern about speculation, but rather, even if we get something out there, will we be able to implement it? Indeed, will we be able to, you know, deal with authorization applications, et cetera, going forward? Because so far, that's not been the strong suit. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it, it's a very complicated thing, isn't it? I mean, once we get people into the regulated arena, obviously, uh, I mean, our system does an awful lot of the work up front in the authorization process, and then that it becomes lighter touch for the regulators once things are up and running within the guardrails. But it's a question of what we do, you know, what, what, how we define those guardrails. And, you know, I think that there's the digital asset world, which are the financial products that are being digitized right. and subject to the digitization of that product or the token being sufficiently inextricably linked from the thing that they're digitizing you know the the general which is, creates an, a risk of if there's any risk of them being split apart or traded right. away but if they're the same thing then the existing technology probably doesn't need much change for those agreed and then you get to the crypto world you know for which people are increasingly use the word crypto to refer to cryptocurrencies and those things have no independent they're not tied to anything right. they're just a concept of sort of Bit of data that's being moved around and the issue there is and they're termed currencies aren't they so cryptocurrencies uh although referred to also by people as assets and investments mm -hmm. the question of which they are and right. 
And that's where it's the hardest thing of all, isn't it? And it needs to be done in coordination, I'd have thought. And the, and the hardest, um, and, and the UK is generally good at conceptualizing these things, but it seems to me it needs a new architecture for the rule book because those assets, I mean, if you look at the traditional risks being addressed by the prudential regime of credit risk, well, there's no credit risk really for those assets. There's market risk, but it's not equity or interest rate risk because they're not equities or debt instruments. They're not really derivatives. So what are they? And so the risk, the risk is that the so-called market value through the exchanges and the trading arrangements crashes mm-hmm. and they're clearly volatile. And how do you then evaluate and how do you calibrate the capital or required and how you can use those for collateral, collateral liquidity purposes when they're so volatile? And that I, and people like Martina are gonna <laughs> You know, need to apply there, you know, come up with some formula or something, it seems to me. To, but then I, yeah. but no, but I think that, that that's a genuine problem, yeah, is uh, uh, once you start uh, thinking of integrating crypto into the regulatory framework, you do end up with issues like that. The other one, and I, I would love to hear your views, is uh, uh, it, it is a retail product. I mean, we very often we think about... Uh, among ourselves, like if it wasn't a retail product, but it is a retail product. And uh, if you regulate it, you legitimize it. And then backstops Barney, then you are, the FCA is going, there's going to be political pressure to use the financial services compensation fund. And then, and if you kill the risk in crypto, do you have crypto? Does it exist? Is it a a valuable business model? I don't know. I would love to hear your views on that one. Well, tomorrow, do you want to go first? Definitely not. <laughs> in, in a way, it's an academic question because at the moment the UK, then the regulators in the Treasury have taken the view that these should not be marketed to retail. There shouldn't be retail crypto derivatives and to, right. to basically protecting. Now, obviously, you can't stop the fact that these things are offered from all over the world online and people in this country and everywhere else are trading yeah. them anyway. Yeah. Uh, it's not within the official sector. So they're saying, look, this is nothing to do with us. And that now has been adopted as an approach by Singapore. So there is a sort of, um, there is a sort of viewpoint, and the UK is part of this, that, that um, they, they can't be allowed. We, we haven't got enough information yet to deal with them for retail. And maybe that needs to be left as it is for a while. But as you say, the crypto businesses are saying, well, you know, we need retail. That's where the liquidity all is. Uh, it's not yeah. just a rich, a richer person's or businesses thing. You know, get your heads around it and figure out how to deal with it. And I agree with you. The political risk, given the volatility of these things, is immense. Agreed. Agreed. And, and you know, I think the reality is that there's already a sort of slide um, that's happened. I mean, in reality, you know, Martina's right. It is a retail. Pro- it started, you know, as a, as a retail product, in fact, because it certainly didn't start anywhere else. But I think trying to pull, you know, pull back um, it is hard. And, uh, you know, I think obviously already in the US, you've got, you know, moves around trying to um, have, you know, exchanges be allowed to trade. Um, directly with no, you know, financial services inter uh, intermediary, as it were, and I think there's going to be big question around where that leads you, um, and certainly big question around, you know, what can be regulated and what can't. And, and Barney, I think you put your finger on it. You know, what is what is a cryptocurrency? When is it tied to something? When is it not? You know, what do we define these things as? And I think even that has eluded a number of, of regulators. Um, you know, it, again, I think still some question under, you know, if you look at things, the distinction between a digital asset versus a, a, a cryptocurrency, that's not altogether clear. So I think we've got a ways to go before, you know, not only do you get the, the FCA, who's absolutely, I, I think, by all indications, headed in the right direction. Um, but, you know, then we start thinking about that's, this is still a global or systemic issue. It does have implications for payment services globally. How does that get regulated and how does it not create systemic risk no matter what you do? Because if we do something that, you know, the the cryptocurrency um, traders don't like, they're going to go somewhere else. It still maintains the same 
uh, systemic risk if used. And again, I think the the keeping it away from retail seems, um, you know, fantasy at best, frankly. And this is where we get the stable coin, isn't it? it? Sorry, Martina. No, I was just wondering whether, how do you feel then about, um, well, in early March, we had a treasury announcement, we had a government announcement saying that they wanted the UK to become the hub of uh, crypto, the, the leading global hub of crypto. Do, do you think that's the right approach? Do you think uh, is and do you think is that's the right approach? And do you think that's the right timing to make to to make that move? I mean, I personally think it is. I think this is happening out there in a very major way in the world, whether people like it or not. The UK is one of the two hosts one of the two global markets. There are people here and businesses here exposed to directly or indirectly crypto, whether whether the regulators, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, so 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 it needs some sort of conceptual um, ar arrangement. The UK retail you know, market is, is protected in the way that we discussed, and there is a whole topic around that. I mean, in the categorization that I mentioned earlier, that's one bit we were just getting to, which I'd admitted, because it's sui generis, is the stablecoin world. And the UK, the first thing the UK has announced, as it's definitely going to do, which it's definitely going to do, is, is um, regulate um, you know, systemic stable coins in the payment system world, you know, uh, uh, under the payment system regulatory architecture. And, uh, and that's what CPMI OSCO at an international level said should happen. The UK is doing that. I think that's sensible. And the, then as we see through, you know, looking at Tether and so on, the next question is, okay, so what's the stable coin that we're going to recognize in this context and what's valid and what isn't? And that's the hardest, you know, exactly. question. It's very difficult. And that's where the science, so I think it needs a lot of thoughts, and, and, and I think they're going to break the problem down into lots of different smaller parts, as one has to. And I think the starting with the stable coins is, you know, is, is sensible, because those are the closest to, a uh, out of the crypto, you know, yeah. the digital assets we talk about, out of the crypto assets, those are the closest to a, rec a normally recognisable thing. And, the, and there we need to then make sure that they are, you know, how, how close are they? Where's the risk that we're not capturing through the normal thing? And do they benefit from the laws that look at money, for instance? Is a, is a, are any stable coins going to be the same as sterling that is legal tender and transferable easily? Or is that only a CBDC? And if it's not, then how can you, how, how does it have to be used? And then who buy? And then I think that may get into the retail market. I do think that's going to come into retail, but it's a question of which one, whether it's Tether, I've no idea, but I think some of them will. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think, uh, um, so if you look at uh, something like Tether, um, it's back to the dollar. So normally you wouldn't expect uh, to have uh, any kind of um, uh, um, benefit from trading, having Tether rather than dollars by definition in the normal world. So what the benefits is from the lending tether. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And that's where people have been uh, brought, been brought into the tether world is by the idea, the advertisement of getting a 20% yield. Hmm? So, and and it, that, that's what the problem, if from a regulatory perspective, that's, that's part of the problem. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And then you have the issues of custody. So whom does that money really belong? You have the issues of uh, hypothetical uh, lending. You have the, yeah, you have a whole range of other issues that um, then if they are get sorted and you have well, the same kind of uh, regulatory approach that is applied to banks. I don't know if Tether it's profitable. I'll, yeah, the return point is very interesting, isn't it? I mean, this goes into what is a stable coin because Tether isn't backed one to one by a dollar in each, you know, for each Tether, right? So there's there's other things we don't know exactly what that back these, you know, instruments that give them their value, and I think that is going to be brought into the regulatory arena. That's the bit that they're going to focus on in the very, very first instance and defining when people can legitimately claim that that's the case and when they can't. Because if their algorithm formula management process for backing things with the dollar, you know, doesn't do it and, or, or isn't, doesn't do it to the satisfaction of the market. So when there's a time of market stress, you get the split. That's a problem, it seems to me, or at least 
then it mm. can't claim that it's the same as a dollar. And then you get the investment return. OK, fine, that's an investment return there. But in return for what? I mean, what risk are you running by holding it? And how do you define that risk? Oh. Well, interesting. Well, I think it, it's certainly going to be. And again, I think, you know, Barney, the, the, this, the easy point of agreement is that it's something regulators have to look at. <laughs> it just it just you can't ignore it. I think because, you know, we are a financial center. Um, you know, we have almost naturally become a hub for these things. So again, our regulator cannot ignore it. But the big issue is whether our regulator can get it right, um, whatever right looks to be. And right, I think, is both from a systemic perspective, but also obviously from an, you know, the perspective of the currencies themselves and how they are perceived. Because if we don't do something that is predictable, um, you know, that is perceived as um, uh, understanding what these are and what their purpose is, that, you know, that gives the ability for certainty, um, you know, again, to the currencies themselves, then they will go elsewhere. And so, you know, we're still stuck with whatever we do has to deal with this. And I think, you know, I think the reality is this is a part of our system and our payment system in particular, um, but our but our financial system um, overall. So how we address it from a regulatory perspective, you know, certainly from a major financial center matters. But the question is, what are the other alternatives? And, you know, how does that then influence what the FCA perceives as, you know, its ability to do something that is you know, again, with some of the, the you know, professed objectives around international perspective and growth oriented while still being safe. And so, you know, there's a little bit of schizophrenia in that generally um, in, in what's coming out of the, you know, the, the Queen's speech and indeed the, the regulator now. So it's just a, how do they land and all that? And where does that, you know, where does that leave us again as a hub? Um, or, or, or indeed as the opposite, you know, do we somehow, you know, repel because we've tried to regulate when others have not gotten there. So I, I think there's a lot of finesse in that, that has, you know, that has to come. Can we move on to the Queen's speech, which yes. uh, Tamara's mentioned a couple of times and, and mm -hmm. is sort of um, uh, a massive development in the UK and, and we should, we should talk about um, so this in proposes to introduce new statutory objectives for the financial services regulators to support growth and international competitiveness. Uh, controversial points in some quarters, um, but uh, it's restoring to some degree. We didn't have you used to have growth, but we had international competitiveness. Restoring the position pre-financial crisis when there was a backlash against this notion. <laughs> Uh, there isn't anything about the devolution plans um, the Treasury have to devolve a lot of the EU inherited law to the regulator rule books, but there's nothing to indicate that that's on hold. It looks as if that's just carrying on. It's already in progress. So we've got this. The regulators are going to get more rules. They're going to be told to strive for international competitiveness. And then in the Queen's speech, there's the announcement of the continuation of things the Treasury have consulted on. So implementation of realizations in the wholesale markets review, solvency two, including what insurance companies, life insurers and so on can put their um, investments into is it UK infrastructure. Obviously that's the intention now, uh, as opposed to wider diversification, um, or at least um, adjusting the um, diversification requirements. Uh, there's something on access to cash, sort of, which is a counter availing thing to make sure that people around the country still have cash. There is some stuff on cryptocurrencies. We talked about that. And then there's the prospectus uh, regime taking forward the changes in the Hill review on that. So the, uh, many of these are sort of liberalization points. I suppose the question arises, you know, is this to be expected? Should there be any check and tack? How does it fit with what's going on in our previous discussion in the crypto world? Um, you know, is this all uh, consistent? Yeah, I must admit, Barney, I, I think it's it's a, you know, if you kind of read your way through, 
um, there is an inconsistency and, you know, but it's maybe a natural one, which is we are at a moment in time, um, not only, uh, you know, sort of politically here and as a consequence of Brexit and the delivery of the advantages of Brexit that say liberalization is the norm. It's what we'd expected. It's what we're getting. It's what, um, you know, the focus is on. At the same time, you know, we have an, an increased, um, you know, incidence of fraud and concern about you know, payment services, about, you know, what is, what is happening, um, you know, with financial products out there. So you get comments like, um, you know, Financial Services Minister John Glenn saying the new growth and international competitive objective uh, for the Bank of England and for the Financial Conduct um, Authority is secondary to the top aim of keeping markets, consumers, and companies safe and sound. And so you, you kind of have this, as I say, slightly schizophrenic approach. Um, on the one hand, a lot of the liberalization and the talk, you know, certainly, you know, government indications is we want to lighten the load on business and, and particularly the financial services sector, um, the burning red tape, you know, all of that, you know, get the bonfire of, of you know, of all the red tape uh, language. And then at the flip side is coming back to some of the things that, and, and crypto is one of them, where this safety, security, soundness, you know, kind of comes through. And so I think, you know, as we look at some of the things that are coming out, um, including things like the oversight of the third party providers to financial services sector, that all really comes out of this security safety approach. Um, and yet, you know, again, where, where I think we're seeing some of the other um, expectations is that we are, you know, lightening some of the load, um, particularly on financial services. So it's trying to parse your way through, especially in the absence of any of the actual, whatever, 38 odd bills that were announced in, um, in the Queen's speech, but in particular, the, uh, the financial services and markets bill, trying to figure out where that's going to go. Um, but, you know, but to my mind, I think that that safety piece we have to assume is somewhere there, you know, hovering, um, no matter sure. how liberal we want to be. No, I completely agree. And I think the, the reason that international competitiveness has been introduced, is being introduced as a secondary objective, as you say, to systemic risk, is to make quite clear to people, I mean, what, the, what the, a lot of the commentators who are against this concept um, after the financial crisis and blamed it to some degree for the financial crisis, um, were saying, well, it led to this chase for business over and above safety. And so therefore, now I think it's been put clearly as a secondary thing. So none of this should mean that it's not, it, it, it's not safe or sound. My personal view is that these reforms, the Hill Review reforms, the wholesale market reforms, sovereignty too and so on, are, are all sensible ones. I think there's a massive um, shift, which is I don't regard as deregulatory, but is just a change of technique which is happening iteratively um you know piecemeal after brexit but from out, coming out of the eu code based system where everything is written down and covered and there's a, a rule for each thing to our method which is more disclosure based with market discipline and caveat emptor and the courts being involved right. and so from moving from one to the other so just by removing some of the restrictions in the wholesale markets will review from inherited mifid 2 you know, some of the position limits things. Yeah. I mean, those those were controversial in part also because they created risk and they could displace risk in, in different ways. So as I see it, part of this really is a change in technique without reducing risk. And in fact, on Solvency 2, the regulators have been scrubbing the proposals for which how much of a percentage change there should be. And there have been, you know, debates and, and it's all been refined in conjunction with the regulations mm. industry um but the but the, the effort is to make sure it's safe but just done in a different way with un, without unnecessary tie-ups of risk margin and matching adjustments and so on but do you think uh, that there uh, there is an issue with resources in the among the regulators because i was just thinking of tamara's comment before huh, on uh, highlighting the the lack of resources and now, so if I see that, I see crypto, poof, big one, yes, uh, third party providers, I see the delegating powers, I mean that, the, the, previously in, a, in an EU world, uh, the FCA had to do 
um, much less work in terms of uh, uh, policy. I mean, clearly it was um, uh, a lot of it was done, uh, most of it was done by the Treasury and the EU institutions. No? So now, can they do all of these things? And uh, Barney, going back to your think of uh, the, the, the difference of approach, so it's not so much the, the level of regulation, but how that is going to be uh, implemented. And uh, is one more light touch than the other from a regulator perspective, not from not from the regulatee, but the regulator. Which one takes more resources? Uh, that's a hard question to answer. I'd say, I think they can go to your first question. I think they can do it. Um, I think there's a, so our method involves fewer rules, which are clearly drafted, and then enforcement, the, the courts play a role and the private sector yeah. plays a role with bringing cases to court. So that element is taken away from the regulators in the way it's self-executing once you've drafted your rules more. Mm. Um, and then because the rules are clear, you should have fewer needs to interact, you know, as a firm or individual with the regulators on those rules so it should take off the table some of the engagement that happens on the other hand there's we need to expand to some new topics like crypto and so on so that expands what they do but joining up the policy the rulemaking and the policy with the supervision and enforcement of a fewer number of rules very fo much focused solely on financial risk really which is the job of the regulators i think should make it easier now whether it reduces your 4000 staff in the sp CA, whatever the number is, I don't know, but it, it should mean that when they're supervising someone and they see something they don't like, then instead of triggering a whole process of making legislation through the Treasury and Brussels and so on, they can make a quick adjustment to their rules saying, no, no, we don't like that, here's a new rule. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think, Martina, you're right. Certainly to start with, there's a big ask. Um, and, and I think the big ask is in regulation and drafting and getting something in the clear, you know, getting the clear rules that you're referring to, Barney, out there to start with oh. um, is a big ask. It, it, you know, it strikes me certainly as you move to a disclosure, transparency, um, you know, caveat emptor, as you describe, you know, approach, in theory, that should require less. And, and I think Barney is absolutely right about that. But I still, I still say, you know, coming back to right now in the moment, given all that has to be done, I mean, certainly, I think that is the biggest skepticism out there. Is is it possible? And 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 even if it gets done, will in fact those rules be clear, Barney? Because will they have had the scrutiny, the consultation, the you know, the the sort of work um, that they need to be what we need? you know, in the moment and, and how fast are things moving? How quickly do you get it out there? You know, how fast are they obsolete or at least out of date? You know, all of that I think is really up for grabs. And I've proposed that they bring in the private sector because I agree that's a very significant job ahead in moving from A to B because we at the moment have got the panoply of code then we've got all these new topics to add. Yeah. Then we're taking bits out piecemeal, but small bits at a time. It seems to me we've got to go much more quickly and get to something which is manageable by the regulators on their own, which for which the existing staff may not you know, be able to sort of get that level of change. So I think if they could organize something where they bring in the private sector people pro bono to come up with yeah. under their supervision, so they would nothing would happen unless they decide yes okay that's sufficiently good or even very good drafting from some other people we'll take that and we don't like this bit or that right. needs to if they manage that then there is the resource in the city of the as a whole to do this extremely quickly and very well it's a great point i suspect if anyone's listening you know you've just made a really good voluntary announcement there you're volunteering uh, no doubt barney <laughs> i want to ask on a similar point then what about the legal profession and uh, and and the capacity on the courts because in a way what you're suggesting is to shift from from regulatory work to legal work yeah, and to the courts and me i was reading then the courts are totally clogged up in the uk right now so is uh, is that true? What what is should the city start working on that? Should the city start pushing for more resources into the justice system? 
I think so. I think, and, and in fact, it's worse than that because the ombudsman scheme, which is a lot of lots of theme of non-lawyers, are given the power to make choices in commercial cases and make decisions effectively without recourse to that, without looking at the law at all. I, I think we should look at plans to get in. Uh, and we could start with pro bono secondments, you know, a day a week, half a day a week from practitioners in, in the city, you know, to, to deal with quickly to deal with claims, which at the first instance, and then they can always be appealed if people say, no, that's not a fair outcome to, to, to um, the High Court or wherever. Um, so I, I do think, yeah, I, do, I think um, our system requires a greater use of the court system, not along American lines, which is different for a whole load of historical reasons, but it does require a greater use than we have now of the court system in order to work on a yeah. self and I think greater expertise in that too, Barney, you know, is going to be a big issue because again, I'm not sure, you know, you don't go to a, from a sort of not being as, you know, as involved to a court system that actually understands the financial system and sector, you know, overnight. Um, and you're right, if we pull the private, you know, the private sector in, that's useful. Not that we have any capacity to spare at the moment, as you well know. <laughs> the reality is our sector is you yeah. know, also underwater. So, I, I, you know, again, I think it comes back to this, you know, very, very big ask, um, not just of, of government, of the regulators, but really of, you know, of our economy as a whole to have the resources to do what the ambition that's laid out is, um, you know, and I think that's, that's a big one. <laughs> I do agree, actually. It's a vast, I mean, you know, because, you know, not to scare us all off, I mean, it's it, it, this issue is replicated across the entire economy. Well, exactly. And, um, yeah, I mean, but we do have lots of good lawyers in the system and others to call on in, you know, com other common law countries who are sort of similarly trained, right. use the same, the same sort of thought process. So I think it's doable, but it, re it will require a level of organisation and pooling of resource and pulling in bits from all sorts of relevant places in a way that we haven't, you know, ever, ever done, done before. before. Exactly. I'm okay. Sure. Any, um, any things that were not in the build and you wanted to see? Well, interestingly, there wasn't anything on the auditors in the writ in the announced uh, or the, the Queen's speech element that was read out. Uh, but checking the written version of the Queen's speech um, did cover the audit reform proposals uh, the government have, mm -hmm. um, which have been, you know, talked of trail for ages, which is the replacement of the Financial Reporting Council with auditing, audit reporting and so on. So, so that's happening. Um, you've touched already on third party providers. We don't yet know really what that's going to mean, but that's sort of dealing with the massive shift to the use of you know, cloud-based support. Exactly. data in particular, yeah. Environment. And fraud being linked to that, I think, is a big piece of this. It's back to that sort of safety and security point. But I think, um, you know, that that in and of itself is also a big ask if you start thinking about, you know, where does that take us? Um, you know, data and outsourcing generally. I mean, the financial sector is a prolific user um, of the outsource model and has been for years. So where data goes, how that's, um, you know, how that's been implicated in, uh, in connection with fraud, which, you know, which is a lot of what the driver for this is, you know, I, again, I suspect the ambition is easy to state. Um, the, the regulation behind it and what it does, how it does it, and, you know, if it can do it in a way that does not seriously impinge upon the resources of the very sector they're trying to make better, but also make us a hub for and you know, not have us uh, become you know overburdened I, I still see that as a you know pretty a pretty fine balance to strike I agree and I think um, you know uh, placing reliance on someone's computer system a lot of them in America which are doubtless very high quality but you know putting a leap into you know it, 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 there isn't the same element of supervision and control over that so the question is, how to sort of get back to the same place as, as we're in with things locally. And I suppose the answer is mainly there needs to be an agreement with the US as to how to deal with some of these outsourcings. And then the other one is ESG, you know, um, exactly. massive, massive um, issue that we all face. And, and um, that wasn't 
cover that accepts, I mean, in another context in terms of the energy security bill for cheaper, cleaner, and more secure energy. And so, you know, and I think that's because the regulators, when they have the power to run all the rules and have complete power to do it, and we already do, um, to, on many topics, including many ESG aspects, but you know they, they can they can they, you know I, may, I think it's not really such a statutory point to deal with disclosure requirements and carbon offsets, but that is a massive topic out there that was was yeah. I, I think that's why it wasn't addressed. Yeah, I think that's I mean I think that's right. Although I must admit I looked at that and thought that's one area which maybe slightly you know to those who are are focused on sustainability um and indeed who believed um you know who believed the statements uh, by the chancellor and cop 26 you know that this is where the government might decide oh he we here's where we can be liberal and leave businesses alone especially in light of current economic climate and and that's probably pretty worrying to those who care about the climate generally um and so you know that that struck me as probably not a great sign that, you know, I think, I think the government briefed the media that they made a last minute decision uh, to remove the plans to force companies to, um, to report on their environmental uh, impact, really in light of where we are, you know, inflation looming, you know, uh, cost of living crisis, et cetera. So it tells you where the government's thinking is around the importance of sustainability and climate. Um, generally, apparently, it isn't all that important. And again, I think for those who care about that sort of thing, it was a pretty big signal. And in the meantime, there's massive private sector element efforts to create uh, reporting, you know, disclosure rules that are consistent, you know, with the new um, ISSB and. Um, SASB and so on. Um, yeah. Very. You know, and so, so it may be that these sorts of efforts will lead to a more sophisticated results in an, a year or six months or whenever they've sort of completed their work. Uh, that's probably right. I, I say I think it's as much an indicator of, of the government's thinking, you know, as it is about where we might land in terms of regulation uh, on that front. And I think the same to some degree. You're right about. Um, audit reform being mentioned, you know, it was in this sort of you know, appendices. Um, but again, I think a lot of commentators took away from the fact that it wasn't explicit in the Queen's speech, that this was yet another area where government might be slightly soft peddling and leaving business to kind of get on with it and not overburden them in a moment, you know, when they feel like that could affect um, the, you know, the economic environment. Well, I am surely aware a lot of people are thoroughly disappointed with that, but uh, um, and then have interpreted yeah. it the best way. Yes, yes. Um, we only have very, very few minutes left. So, um, is there anything else in that uh, Queen's speech that impacts financial services that we should be aware of? Well, I had a couple of sort of things that that. Um, I think a key uh, one is the Brexit Freedoms Bill, mm -hmm. which actually is maybe not what you'd think it is, um, dealing with um, inherited EU law, retained EU law, and how that's interpreted, and whether you uh, whether the UK should defer to old uh, CJEU um, rulings, uh, and if so, on what basis and to what degree. You know, the supremacy of retained EU law, uh, including over Parliament, obviously that is a constitutional issue. Um, and some other aspects to do with sort of, you know, inherited EU jurisprudence. And I, th and I think that is essential to get, it's a very important announcement, although very technical and detailed, to get right, I mean, it needs to be get, got right in the context of our previous discussion of yeah. moving from one system to another. We've got to get those inherited details yeah. right, otherwise we won't do it. And then yeah, the other one, yeah. 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 And the other one's data reform, you know, exactly. again at GDPR, inherited GDPR and making some changes. I haven't said how, but um, that is a massive topic for the financial markets because uh, I think that that's um, a large element of why we don't have big data businesses in, the, in Europe to the same degree as there are in the US. And I think there are lots of well-intentioned protections in GDPR, which yeah. are unarguable. But the way they're implemented effectively means that some of the services that arise from the US that people in Europe then opt into and use anyway uh, are not available. 
So I, I think allowing and for financial services, I think this is key. I completely agree. And again, I think it's an area where, you know, the devil will be in the detail. Um, you know, there are the, you know, the ambition is, is surely right. And, you know, any, anybody who's done anything with GDPR will feel that way. Um, but at the same time, you know, the, the sort of practical challenges that relate to what we do then do and implement and how that affects businesses operating on a cross-border basis are significant. And I think they're most significant. Well, I know the financial services sector best, so I would think they're most significant, but they're particularly significant uh, for, for our sector. Great. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. And um, I hope to see you soon. Thank you for sharing your insights. Bye. Thank you. Keep watching that.